Um, <clears throat> okay, so today, uh, make sure that you, uh, everybody can see the screen because <laughs> trust me, you're gonna need to see that. Um, this speech is about the, the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, but uh, most of the concepts applies to, to any virtual machine. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, how the code is loaded to the virtual machine. I'll be talking about how the code is executed, some approaches of executing the code that could be like even interpreting text or uh, generating bytecode and executing that generated bytecode. And lately I'll be talking about the, the garage collection. There is a hands-on session that I hope to have time. If anybody has a laptop here, you can see the presentation on that link. And skip to the slide 85, I think, to, to take a look on the, on the hands-on part. But uh, most of these slides are just silly animations, so don't be scared. Um, and of course, if you'd like to ask any questions, feel free. Uh, thanks to Cork Dev for allowing me to speak for something that is not related to the user interface. Um, so, uh, a virtual machine, what does it do? A virtual machine, basically, it will mimic uh, a real machine by doing those things that I told you, like executing, uh, loading, and executing code. Um, in Java, the way to load code uh, is by using a class loader. A class loader is something that loads uh, pieces of code on demand. So, when you're executing a Java application, not all of the application code is in memory yet. It, uh, it, it performs a lazy loading. And how they're loaded can be decided by the class loader. So uh, mo most of the times you learn that you, you need to have jar files or class files somewhere. Uh, this is not entirely true. Um, there is a, <coughs> uh, we have a, a class called class loader in the Java library that it has just a method called find class. So we can implement this method anyway. We can uh, go through the internet, we can read an XML file or do all of the crazy things that you can imagine. And then if you just return a class, uh, it is fair enough. Uh, the, the, the Java virtual machine don't bother how you're loading the, the classes. Um, Class uh, we have a hierarchy of class loaders. So <coughs> by hierarchy, I mean that all the class loaders, uh, they have a parent. Uh, this is the actual, the, the code of the, of the class loader uh, from the Java library, and it has a parent. Every class loader has a parent. Don't ask me about the first one, because I don't know how do they do that. Just kidding. Um, so let's do just an example. We have the, a simple hierarchy of jar files here. Uh, the boot jars, uh, they are the, the libraries from the Java virtual machine itself. And we have other two libraries, uh, library A and library B. So the application asks, okay, I'd like the, the, the main class. Do you have the main class? Yeah, not here. Library A, do you have the main class? Uh, not here. Library B, do you have? Eh, just a second, not here. But library B, actually, it was reading some uh, text file that had some kind of a uh, customized code. For example, um, I don't know, some Ruby file from JRuby, and then it generated the, some code on the fly. It is possible because it's just a matter of implementing a class loader. Uh, if you imagine how to do that in, I don't know, in C and C++, it is a little bit more difficult than just implementing a, a, a method. So this runtime generated code, okay, the class is here. So it, it gives lots of flexibility. For example, web applications, uh, they can be deployed in the server and then uh, every time you deploy a new web application, that runtime generated code is generated again or it creates a new instance of class loader and all of the other uh, things that were loaded before, they just go to the garbage collector, collector to be collected. So that's okay. Uh, any questions on this? Am I going too fast? Or... Okay, silence is never good. <laughs> so, okay, let's move on. Um, 
we have a bunch of ways to, to exe execute code. Uh, by code, I'm talking about, uh, we have the class file, but the, the code itself is the, the methods or the functions that we have. Uh, it, it is what the, does the, the real work. So we have a bunch of ways to execute code. Uh, one of the ways is to interpret a, a, a text file, for example, I don't know, um, I, I have a kind of dynamic language and I, <clears throat> I will read all of the lines and I will try to evaluate them. Um, every line I will be trying to, okay, can I extract some useful information from here? Can I generate an abstract syntax tree from here? Oh yes, that's cool. So on each line, uh, the application will try to, to, to execute and to see if that line is valid or not. So. Just, uh, I'll be just doing the, the simple example ever for each approach. Uh, so let's sum two numbers. I have some code here uh, and I will generate an AST on the fly. So we have the variable J, we have the variable I. We have a sum, uh, <coughs> a sum here, uh, binary operator. So this operator can be a new node on the abstract syntax tree. And we have a return statement that depends on the sum, and the sum itself depends on both variables. So to evaluate the, the return, I need to evaluate the j, I need to evalu evaluate the i, the sum itself, and then I'll be able to, to return some value. And some of, uh, in some parts, it can be only known at the, at the runtime. So unfortunately, most of the errors are, are caught at runtime as well. Uh, which is, uh, sometimes it is good because it gives you flexibility, sometimes it is bad. Um, another approach, instead of uh, interpreting text files, um, ah, any questions on this? Nope, okay. So again, silence, all of you. Um, <coughs> so, another approach is to compile. Compiling code, um, we'll be getting the, the text, will be translating them to binary. Actually, it's kind of interesting because even Ember, uh, it does some compilation, but from, uh, from text to text. Compilation is a good thing because you can verify some things prior to the execution. So here, I'm uh, we'll be translating the text to the to binary, and then we'll be able to, to get some errors at the compile time, so before putting the on the server or before distributing your application, you'll be able to, to know if anything is wrong. Not all of the errors, of course. Um, and by compiling to binary, uh, it could be native code, code that your processor understands. It could be some virtual machine byte code. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, possibilities here. And by bytecode, I mean byte-sized opcode. The opcodes are just numbers that the, the machine or the virtual machine they will be using to, okay, what do I do, I do with this data? Uh, let's see, opcode one. One is sum, for example. So it could be just an if or a switch statement or uh, a table, whatever. Um, <coughs> So we have two, two types of binary execution, two main types. Uh, we can have a register-based uh, execution. Um, registers uh, are something that we uh, have on our computers, on the, on the hardware part. It works like your processor. Um, again, we'll be summing two numbers. So I have some kind of a pseudo-assembly code here. Uh, the, the first thing is the opcode, and the, the two parameters uh, are just parameters to the, the opcode. So the first instruction is saying to move the value 1 to the, the first registry. Uh, so it will put 1 on ORC1, which is OK. And the, the next one is just summing 2 to the current content of R one So then we get the result. If you, if you take a look, we needed uh, just one space in memory and we needed uh, just to, to pass to two uh, operations, uh, to two opcodes. So it was kind of easy to, <coughs> uh, 
uh, we didn't need much memory, we didn't need much space to, to execute the opcodes, but the downside is that this thing can be really, really difficult to write a compiler. Um, because, oh, have I used the uh, which registry is free? So we have a bunch of problems that you need to think about if you're writing a compiler. And actually, even uh, the JavaScript, uh, the V8 uh, machine, it will be translating the, the, the text to some kind of a binary uh, code. I didn't do any, any of the, the JavaScript virtual machines uh, a lot, so I can't talk much about them. And we have another approach. Uh, okay, any questions in relation to this? Questions? No? Okay. I guess everybody knows assembly. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the other approach, uh, it is a stack-based execution. So uh, uh, do anybody have a HP calculator here, those old uh, 48G calculators? No, nobody. Come on. <laughs> no, really, I, I had this one. Uh, not sure if because I'm from Brazil, but. Uh, <laughs> Okay, um, basically we have this code. Um, you see that we don't have uh, many arguments uh, to, the, to each operation, but you have, we have more operations. So to perform the same sum, uh, we'll be first populating the stack with the, the first argument here. We'll be populating the stack with the second argument. And then the operation will consume the stack and the result will be back on the stack. Um, the, the good thing about this approach, it is really, really, really easy to write a compiler. Because, uh, how can I say, if you're uh, just working with the text file, you go to each node, keep pushing, pushing, uh, and then uh, perform the operation, it will consume the stack, the stack will be growing and shrinking a lot during the, the execution. So it is really, really easy. Not easy to write a compiler, but easier. Um, <coughs> the JVM is stack-based. So one of the reasons is because it is kind of easy to write. But uh, eventually, the code it gets uh, compiled to, uh, to native code by one thing called uh, JIT, uh, just-in-time compiler. So if you have a method that is called over and over and over, then it, okay, maybe it would be a good thing to translate this to a faster code. Um, if you have something that you'll be called just once, it doesn't matter. Like, uh, you'll be spending more time translating that to native code than to executing that in the bytecode format. So the JVM does this kind of decision on the fly. Um, <clears throat> and actually, this is really good for long-running applications. So, any questions on the execution? Can you force to compile without JIT or with compiling within platform if you want to? Um, actually, uh, the, uh, the answer is yes, but it is not always good. Uh, I know that we have, for example, the compiler from the GNU project that's a GCJ. Uh, in theory, it will translate all of your classes, but actually, since we have the class loaders, if you start to think about it, uh, the class loaders, they can't, uh, not the class loaders, but the classes and uh, dynamic code, it can't be translated to native code. So the way that the JVM is implemented uh, makes uh, this a uh, kind of poor choice if you decide to, unless your application has some kind of limitations, for example, Android platform. There is a bunch of stuff that you can't do on Android. Uh, the Google uh, app server. You can develop in Java, but your uh, you have some things that are forbidden. This is to uh, uh, they restrict some, some of the freedom so they can make some kind of crazy optimizations or uh, different translations and things like that. So yes, you can, but in truth, uh, better not. <laughs> so I try to put JBoss within a single executable. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so <clears throat> any more questions about the, the execution? Okay, so right now I'm talking about memory. Um, we, uh, the native languages, usually they treat the memory as a big array. So 
uh, I'm gonna say, uh, you can uh, create objects uh, in this big array. We have, uh, we have some code here that is kind of a pseudo uh, C++ code. Uh, this square thing, uh, not square, but uh, this rectangle thing is, uh, is your memory space. So let's develop this thing uh, the same way that we did for the, the, the byte codes. Uh, so we, there is, uh, we are using a space within this uh, big memory array. So a new integer was created. It, it is using just one slot. Uh, the runtime we realized, okay, so right now we have a new object and need to use more two slots for this one. By the type, it can realize the size of the type and then it can use the, the memory according to the, the type. So this other class is uh, twice as big as the previous one. So we are using the, this space and then if you don't need any more, you del delete the, the, <coughs> the previous instance. And then we have some space in the memory. Um, is there anything that can be problematic here? Fragmentation. Yeah. So fragmentation is a problem. Um, we have enough space here to fit this variable, but we don't have continuous space. And actually, the addresses in the native languages they don't change. Uh, in Java, you don't have access to the addresses because they can change internally. So, another problem with this approach, any guesses? We can have a memory leak. If we forget to, to delete the variables, the memory will be still use it. And trust me, it is really, really easy to, to forget things if you're not using I, I don't know, uh, some, some good approaches on, on C and C++ code. Um, another problem, we can have an invalid pointer, which is just a variable pointing to some place that is invalid, or even using uh, the wrong memory space. And those applications, they will just crash. They won't say, ah, invalid pointer exception. Uh, in Java, we have the new pointer exception uh, if we try to use something that is new. Uh, we can treat this exception. In, in native languages, it is not that easy. So, uh, the garbage collector, uh, it is a common approach. Uh, it is nothing new uh, to the Java virtual machine. Actually, it is something that uh, old languages uh, implemented, such as Lisp and Smalltalk. Um, and uh, the garbage collector tries to solve this kind of problem. Uh, of course, it, it will introduce some other problems, for sure. But uh, nothing's perfect. You can't have it everything. Um, so let's take here uh, a memory space. This memory space is divided according to a way that was uh, kind of standard from the virtual machine. Nowadays, the, the garbage collectors from the virtual machine, they are way more complicated than this. So we have a space for young objects, and then we have two survivor spaces. We can have more spaces. These sizes can be configured, and things like that. So let's execute this code. Uh, we are creating an L. We are creating? No, we are not. The garbage collector can decide at any point, no. Uh, I will stop your execution right now because I need to organize things here. I need to organize this memory. It's kind of fragmented. Uh, the object is in grade, they are not used. Uh, okay, off you go. Now, uh, the garbage collector, it is able to stop your, uh, the execution at any point. But usually, it will stop the execution when something bad is happening, like when there is no memory available. So, there it is. In the first line, uh, there is this new instance. Uh, before evaluating the second line, these, uh, the parameter needs to be evaluated, so um, we don't have any variable pointing to this, but the, the virtual machine knows that this object will be used by that some other type. And of course, your execution can stop at any point. And then, uh, I'm not sure if you saw what happened here. Um, the, the T and these objects that has no name, they were copied to survivor1 and that other object that I don't have any idea what, what it is called or where it is used, it was copied to the other uh, memory space. 
Uh, this is a common garbage collection algorithm called copy garbage collection. So we have different memory spaces. By just copying from one place to another, uh, we, we get rid of the fragmentation. So, and okay, now the garbage collector let you continue your execution and then uh, we have a new instance here. Since this instance is new, it is in the, the Eden space. And then um, <coughs> we, uh, we have T set to null, but actually T is used within uh, T2. So the garbage collector knows. Uh, it doesn't need to be uh, collected. The T don't need to be collected. But then within this method here, uh, it is deleting, uh, not deleting, but uh, it just stopped using uh, that unnamed object. So uh, the, the garbage collectors, uh, they know, okay, this object is not being used anymore, but the garbage collector can consider this is not a good time to perform the garbage collect uh, collection. So uh, the same way that it can stop your execution, uh, it can just uh, don't stop your execution when it is kind of busy. So all of those behaviors can be configured on the on the virtual machine, and um, that's it, I guess. Uh, any questions? Yeah. In so the, in the, let's say in the scale one to ten, how would you grade the Java automated memory management? Uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, it all depends the, on the way that it is configured. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, uh, I find the, the, the Java garbage collector uh, one of the best ones available. Um, uh, in my experience, I remember, for example, some application were running really slow because of the garbage collection uh, cycles, and then they called me, like, uh, I don't know, at 7, uh, okay, can you come back to work because the production is kind of shitty, I went back. Uh, by doing some diagnostics on the, on the garbage collection uh, log, I changed the, uh, those memory spaces, I changed the size of the memory spaces, I added some, some new parameters. The parameters are not that difficult to configure, and then the application was running smoothly. So, this is amazing. The application got better, and I didn't change any line of code, just the garbage collector uh, parameters. Yep? Um, in Objective-C, um, it deallocates um, variables when it no longer needs them, um, so you don't get the garbage collection issue or, you know, it's Oh yeah, by counting references, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, so the question, or it is just a comment? Well, I just wonder why other languages don't do the same. Uh, the reason is because of cyclic references. Um, for example, in Objective-C, uh, I don't know how it happens in Objective-C, but for example, in C++, by using the uh, some libraries such as Boost, you can have uh, uh, kind of strong references and weak references. So if you have like a, a graph obje uh, of objects, like a parent, a child, and then the child has a reference to the parent, the reference counting doesn't work because you have a cycle. Nobody gets to zero. Uh, that cycle can be isolated. Uh, the garbage collector can detect those cycles. Or in C++, you can use weak references when you, uh, you know that you will have a cycle, but... The in Objective-C, you have weak and strong references to oh, yeah. avoid that. So that's uh, the way. Um, and to be honest with you, uh, I consider reference counting a good thing, but it is kind of easy to forget about. So... Uh, I'm not saying that the, the Java virtual machine is perfect, but uh, in that sense, the, the, the GC does a good job. Um, but I still prefer some native environments for, uh, for some cases. Uh, and Objective-C is really good. Uh, I, I like the, the syntax most people don't like. Uh, I think it is like really, really object-oriented, um, the way that small talk was. But uh, anyway, this is... Uh, <laughs> This, uh, I'm just going outside of the topic. Um, any more, more questions? Oh, yeah. Okay. You recommend, uh, you know that, uh, you recommend? You never, use? never, ever do that. And the reason why is that um, the, the JVM, it has lots of statistics on how the code is being executed. 
And if you keep calling the, the garbage collector, you're just saying, okay, stop the, you're suggesting, actually, on this specification, system.gc, don't perform the garbage collection. It is a suggestion to the virtual machine to perform that. Um, but usually it slows down the, the execution. Uh, the best thing to do is to, to have a good profiler and to see how your code's behaving. Uh, the presentation don't have these links on the references, but uh, I'll put them later because uh, they, they are really useful. Um, any more questions? Okay. Yeah, going back to the example you made about the production issue. Yeah, yeah. Was that the configuration that was by default uh, in there? Yes. So your approach will be to always change that configuration? No. Uh, my approach would be to verify how the, the, the configuration is going. Um, uh, there, there is a, some good profilers. One of them that I love the most is a profiler called your kit. You can just attach that profiler to your environment and see, okay, so am I wasting memory here? Uh, you can see the graphs of the garbage collector just remembering a saw. So if it is like a saw, kind of a small saw on top, it is time to, to configure your, your GC. Anthony? Uh, can you change uh, the configuration of the garbage collector where the application is running? Mm, not on the, the hotspot. Okay. Um, so, um, I will just proceed because uh, we have 4 minutes and 21 seconds <laughs> to finish a bunch of slides. Um, so, we have a few problems with this approach that most of them we already uh, spoke about, like uh, we need to configure in a good way. The GC itself, it can be unpredictable sometimes, like if you run one time and if you run again the same application with the same parameters, um, the, the garbage collection calls can be different. You can't, uh, can I say, simulate that exactly. Um, you don't have any control of the memory layout if you start creating objects. You can't uh, be sure that the object, the object to be one at, at the side of another and another. Like, if you create five objects, they won't be, uh, you can't trust that they'll be uh, sequential to, to each other. And, but at the same time, most people do that wrong. So uh, we can trust the garbage collector to do those things. And I will proceed really fast on this section here. Uh, I, I'm not seeing anybody with the laptop open. So I will just explain here uh, what I did. And you guys are invited to do that at home. Um, you can create a job file, you can compile it to a class file and then take a look on the binary code that is generated. So uh, there is a sample code here. Uh, we have a main method that um, will be executing something. Uh, we are parsing the arguments. We are accumulating uh, the arguments in a fancy way within a loop and things like that. And later on, uh, here, just taking up showing that uh, I was using Java 8 for this. I believe uh, any version from Java 5 would be fine for doing those tests. Um, the second command is just compiling the Java file into a class file. You can do that using Eclipse. And the, the third uh, line is a hex dump for displaying the binary content of this file. And then there it is. Lots of useful information here. Do you, do you guys are seeing anything here that is fancy? Nothing? Do you like coffee? Um, coffee baby is the, the magic number for, uh, for the Java uh, virtu virtual machine. Uh, that, not Java virtual machine, sorry, for the Java class files. So it, if it have coffee baby, the virtual machine, eh, okay, maybe I can load this guy. Um, any other information? We can see the source code name here. Um, we can remove some of the information from the file, but for example, class name and method names, they, they are not removed. Um, there is a string builder here that wasn't on the, sorry, that wasn't on the source code, string builder. Um, and why is that? Um, sorry. Come on. So, why is that? It is because we appended uh, an integer to a string. So the compiler will, eh, okay, maybe it will be faster to, to use a string builder instead of a string. Um, 
we have the method that we implemented and things like that. So we can go deeper and there is a command uh, called uh, Java P, uh, but you can just double click on Eclipse into your class file and then you're going to see some, some strange things like this. So does anybody recognize anything here? Nothing? Come on. <laughs> Even the name of the method. We have the main method here. Um, this thing here, it is loading an object into the stack. It is involving a static method and it is storing the result in the stack again. So, uh, this is uh, that uh, integer parsing thing. Um, it is creating a, a new instance here. Here uh, we have our optimizations of the string summation. So <clears throat> it is creating a new string builder. Um, it is invoking a constructor with a parameter and things like that. So here we have the, the rest of that file with the constructor of the class, with the add method. Can anybody see a loop here? Loop, anybody? Aha, uh -huh, there it is. Ah, uh, but my, somebody told me that go to is something bad. Ah, I'm sorry, assembly <laughs> usually does uh, jumps and things like that, so go to will be there. Um, we have the add method, and then uh, it's not that difficult to, to, to realize what's happening. Like we have on the line seven, uh, put field. So it must be doing something to a field. Um, we can still go deeper and we can take a look on the assembly code. This, find the, the, this part is kind of tricky to do. Um, you need to, to search for Java assembler plugin um, and then download a DLL or SO or DILIB file and copy to the right place. So this is left as an exercise for the, for the reader. Um, and then we can see the, the native assembly output. Um, this is the command line for doing that on our uh, uh, sample class. And actually this large number here is, uh, we are making the, that loop to be executed lots of times so it can be jitted. Um, the JVM will be, okay, this guy is important, so I will be native compiling this. And this is the output. It is more difficult to read, at least for me, because I'm not really, really good on, on on native assembly, at least not yet. But I can read the comments. Uh, I know that this code must be related to the Java Lang object uh, from the Java uh, library, not from uh, our sample library. But you can search the code, and then uh, maybe this guy is related to the that method at times. Um, there is all, uh, the same loop here. On this side, in native assembly, and this side, the uh, on bytecode uh, as a comment. And here, another section, the add method in native as assembly, and again, in uh, bytecode instructions. So, that's it. Any questions? Okay. What would be a use case to look at the uh, assembly output? Okay, in truth, uh, the, the real use case is if you are developing something that must run really fast. Usually the, 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 the bottlenecks of applications are I.O. or, uh, I don't know, um, <coughs> marshalling or marshalling, but uh, if you're doing, for example, some application for, uh, I don't know, stock markets and things like that, you need to tweak the processing. If you, if you need to do some calculations on a memory that needs to run really fast, it can be useful to take a look on the on the native assembly code. And for example, uh, there are some Java libraries that the, the authors, they, they have done op optimizations by analyzing this kind of output. So, any more questions? What are those libraries? Huh? That would be uh, I believe the, uh, the most famous one uh, that I know at least is a library called uh, Disruptor. Uh, that is a library for parallel processing. Um, 
it has a strange way of uh, of uh, creating uh, of using objects that can be parallel processed. And if you don't go deep to analyze the how the instructions are executed, you don't understand why that thing is kind of strange. When you understand, you stop using factory methods, for example. Uh, factory methods. Uh, they can be bad because uh, you create something within your method and then uh, the caller loses control of how the object is created. Um, we see lots of libraries uh, in Java, for example, that they uh, you do something and then you return a new list, you return a new string. You don't have like a... If you should pass some arguments to be populated, it would be better. Uh, because it would give some control of the uh, of the memory, you would be calling the you would be making the, the garbage collector uh, have less work to do, which is a good thing. Um, any more questions? How how works uh, the hot deploy uh, in, and the close loader? When um, you change the hot deploy? Oh yeah yeah actually that that's a, 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 a great use case for the, for the class loader. Um, if you have a, a web application and then you just hot deploy that application to the server, um, uh, the, the class loader holds all of the variables that were loaded. So if you, if you just throw away a class loader, the entire class loader will be elected to be garbage collected. Uh, but in truth, sometimes if one variable is kind of busy, the whole garbage collector won't be collected. So some some uh, web servers they they will run out of memory and some don't. Usually, like web logic is really good. Um, actually, I shouldn't be talking about. Uh, I shouldn't be giving 